Hey, so we're back again with the Polly and Tracker and in this video we're going to look at making melody lines because in the previous video we talked about tips and tricks on how to make a really cool drum beat so I'll put a little link there if you haven't gone and seen it yet. So in this video I wanted to talk about how to make a melody line because melodies can be quite scary, uh, there's a lot of theory that goes in behind them but really I wanted to show off some tips and tricks to help get a framework together on how we can make a melody and getting that into the tracker. Now I'm going to be drawing on some of my classical training here as these guys had a really cool way of handling melodies like they only really had one or two channels to get the type of music across and like you're probably seeing this and already hearing the melody like they're really captivating and some people are quite clever and uh, got a little bit extra out of the machine with uh, doing some fancy tricks but I thought let's bring all that knowledge together and talk about different ways we can use elements of a melody and mono lines to create some really cool polyphony and getting that into the machine and then being able to muck around with it and create some really cool sounds. So let's get straight into it. Now we're back on the Polly and Tracker and I have the original song that we're working on from the Drums and Groove video. Now when I'm about ready to start adding melody elements, I just usually jump straight in and just start picking samples and playing with the five of them. So I'm just going to pick the bass and then I can use this preview to hear what's going on. And then if I hit play, we can hear the drum behind so we can... So it's just a really quick way to figure out what sort of sounds work with it and then we can pull them straight in. We're going to make a simple melody and as I said we're classically trained. So I've just got a very normal square wave oscillator from the Nintendo. So this is just something to work with to start with. It could be a piano sound, it could be whatever sound you like. It's just easy to have a tone that you're so used to that you can more figure out what the melody elements are going to be. So we are dealing with melodies and we're dealing with music theory and I will say my just scratching the surface with what I know but I've shown a little trick that really helps out with setting up like the foundation for a song and it's sort of a mud map that we can use to bring our song together. So if I jump into pattern and just explain what's going on. Um, this top row here is the uh, scale that we have and if you know anything about music theories, we've got keys, we've got scales, and what I've done is I've taken C major and just written it up the top as it is. Now, how do we find out what C major is? If you played the piano and start at C uh, and worked your way up the white keys, that would be C major. You can also have A minor if you start the A and work your way up the white keys as well. So there's sort of a pattern to how they're formulated which I've just written on the back. There's a whole bunch of these different scales that we can use, but really they're just holes and half notes that we just got to remember the pattern of. So if I was going to play our C major, um, just put it back into pattern mode so we can hear what's going on. If I was to play the C major, I'll start on C, which is this note here. And then I go up to, so that's a whole note. So I've got D, then E, F, G, A, B, and then we can jump up an octave and go up to C high. And then same thing with minor. If we wanted to do a C minor scale, we go C, then we go a whole note, and then we go a half note, and then we go whole, whole, oops, got a bit excited there. But yeah, so they're just a bit of formulas and yeah, there's like Phrygian and all these different scales. So have a look online and figure out which ones you want to use as well. Um, but moving on to the next part of the mud map is what we do is we take the C and then we draw out the chord for that note. So if I was to play um, these notes together, so we've got C, E, which is... And then if we were to play D, we could jump up and then switch the notes around. But see how my fingers are sort of changing the pattern, like between this finger and this finger, it's four steps to get to there, and then three. So that would be considered a major triad. And then if we were to jump up to D again, notice how my fingers are three and four. 
So this would be a minor triad. And then we can jump up and add the D on top, uh, sorry, the C. So we've got, get some nice four chords going. And then we got the B here. And honestly, I've drawn out the other notes so we can keep going up the scale so we can add that extra D. And then we can add the F. Probably ran out of the tracker there. These are more the important notes of a chord that we wanted to play. And then these are sort of extra flavoring on top. But if we were to number these one to seven, um, we can sort of make our melodies from that. Like if you ever heard of one, four, five, one, uh, pretty common chord progression, but we got the one chord, we got the four chord, we got the five chord, and then back to the one chord. So we can use these as a way to create the foundation of a melody, but able to jump around inside of it. So if I know that I'm playing a C chord and the melody line is somewhere in here, so like say I'm playing a G and I want to step up to the four chord, I can pick from these notes to uh, amp, like where I wanted to go. So if I wanted to move down, I could pick the um, C or A or jump down an octave or if I wanted to jump up to the fifth chord. So it's just a nice way to highlight which notes you can use. Now I'll put this to the side again, just so it's a bit of reference. And we're going to start looking at how we can create a basic melodies. There are some basics to how a melody is structured. So you've got the timing, you've got the groove. Um, I'm just going to mute the other channels. But on a tracker, we've got a little bit of a constraint because we only have so many channels that we can use to make sound with. And with the Polyan tracker, we have eight, but on the original Nintendo, we had five. And really the first two channels were square waves. So they create that sound. Then there was the triangle wave, which created like a really nice sub sound, or you could use it to make flutes. I uh, had noise channel, which um, percussion, and there's like a half noise, which makes some real buzzy sounds. And then the last one was they had a DCM uh, sample. So really, if you're really tricky, you could play some seven chords or some triads, but you wouldn't have anything else supporting it. So creating melody lines that sit within a structure and sort of allude to a certain chord you're trying to play. Um, there's a way we can use broken chords to map it out. So breaking up a chord into its individual elements and play it for a certain section. So if I was to plot in the um, first chord of our little sheet here, so I'm just going to plot that one in. And then if I play that, we've got that C major sound, but if I switch that to a D, so this would be a C minor chord, it's got that bit of a darker tone to it and your brain sort of remembers how it's being played. So if I was to copy, um, we'll paste it a few times and then we'll alternate between these two. So if we play this, it's like it's a little bit noticeable, but you can hear the change between the C major and C minor, but they sound like they're in tandem with each other. All right, so I've just changed it. So we've got that C major playing. We've got the C major, doesn't sound that interesting. So let's have a look at adding our structure. So being very original, I'm gonna make that one, four, five, one. So there's a couple of ways I can program that in real quickly. So I'm just going to go to the first bar here and, and we'll just copy. Let's do it like that. And then I'll add the other bit in. So we can uh, scale it up using the scroll wheel. So we hit that F and let's just check the notes that are right. So we've got F, we've got A, we've got C and we've got E. All right. So that one worked quite well. Uh, depending if it's switching between major and minor, we'll see if something happens here. Uh, we'll change this one to the G chord. So we'll cool. Now, if we were to have a look at what's going on here, we've got the F, but on here it's made an F sharp, so we can change that back down. So it fits within our framework. So if we were to play this, Yeah, it 
that's starting to sound a bit interesting. And really, what we're trying to do here is block out those chords. So when we start constructing our melody line, we have a bit of reference that we can see that we're working on because we'll use the uh, fifth track to start plotting in our melody. So we've got a pretty stepped rhythm. Let's start making something out of it. So I'm just going to use these notes here. And really, we've got a couple of different ways we can move around because what you really want to look at is some of these intervals that are happening here. Because if we were to just look at this, it's like um, C to E. So it's a four step, then we've got a three step, then we've got a four step. Like it's not moving around that much. So we can add some more vibrance to the melody to jump around. So I might start with the E and then we can add some rhythm to it so we're following what the drums are doing or we can create our own rhythm so we can create our quarter notes or eighth notes so really up to you uh, but i'll go from e probably up b and then come down to g drop down to c And then we'll get to this note and then I can do. So we want to try and make a transition from here to here because I like using a note that sort of leads into the next chord. So what we can do is we can sort of look what, so we're going from here to here and then we've got a few notes that we can use. So we could use that E to make a transition to this chord here. So I'm going to have a look at that see how that sounds and then we'll hit that F so it steps up then we can create a uh, jump to something quite higher so might could jump to high C we'll mute that and see how this sounds cool and we can walk it back down from there all right so I did some basic plotting in and usually what happens is I'll just keep sitting here playing through the loop listening to see how it sounds and then if it doesn't sound quite right I'll come back and edit it. All right so using this bit of paper we've sort of created some jumps between the different chords so we've got a bit of a transition to make a melody from our framework which sounds like and they'll just keep looping on like it's only two bars long but it gives us a basic melody to start working with which was based on our foundation chords that we picked and this is an interesting point because this was just keep like ramping up because we plot in the sound but this is starting to get a bit of a contour so if we listen to it so it sort of goes up down like if you were to draw out the timing it sort of has this line that we can follow through the pitch and Using that melodic contour, there's a few ways we can support it or we can counter it. And this is why I do like the original NES music and how they made their sounds because with limited real estate, they really push the, the melody to really make these catchy beats. So we have our melody structure here and what I might do is just jump over to track six and talk about how we can support this melody. Now supporting melodies sort of follow the same contour as the original melody and it gives it extra flavor. So we can sort of use the uh, chords that we have over here. We can pick notes that sort of follow the general um, contour. So what I might do is start off with the C and then we can jump up. And these can be quite simple as well. So and see how these two fight if I just play them by themselves. So that's what happens when you play two notes close together. Kind of sounds yucky. It does have some uses, so don't think you have to avoid it. But what I might do is that F, I think we change into the next chord so we can jump that up to an a, A, maybe? So just writing something quick. Now I'm sort of looking at the um, pattern itself as well. And that's why I like trackers too, is instead of looking at the notes in a piano roll, you can sort of see how the notes are going to play as a pattern, which to me makes more sense in my mind. 
might be different for you, but if we play this, that E Pro carries on a bit too much, and then yeah, I can just keep sculpting it, but what I'm trying to do is using the initial chords, I'm recreating an extra line that fits within that chord, but also follows the contour of this one. What's the flip side of this? And I used to call it just countering a counter melody, but then I found out there's an actual whole classical musical structure around counterpoint. So this is going to be a very light explanation of that. But what's really happening is we're taking this melody line and we've got this melody line doing its own contour, but we're countering that shape. So if we were just to listen to it by itself, so it goes up and then down, what happens if we create a second melody that goes up, down, up? What I might do instead of going down here, we'll go up. So we'll start at that B5, D, and then we make that at the F. So that melody that we just written has a different flavor to the original one. So if we'll just to, to isolate it. And then if we play them both together. So it creates a more interest to the melody line. And if you don't have to think about the entire song that you want to counter or support the main melody, you could only just want the melody itself playing and then having extra notes support it at some point. So then you could have extra notes that counter the main melody. It's about creating these lines that sort of flow with each other and you create this polyphony with it, which creates these really iconic sounds. And I do enjoy making these types of melodies, um, but definitely experiment and see how you could use something like this with your type of music. Now that we've got some melody lines down, we sort of need that bass as well. So what I might do is we'll bring up uh, fourth channel and I'm just going to remove everything but the root note. Since we're working with bass I thought why not get the uh, triangle sound in there. Now that we're going to make our bass uh, what I've done is I've taken out our construction and just left the root note because really we want that bass to be the drive for it because I sort of avoided using the root note in the melody structure and this will give us nice grounding so if we would play this now that bass is sort of holding the uh, whole melody together. And another thing that's happening here as well is that bass sound. It's actually an octave lower. And I like to think of when I'm making this these types of melodies is I'm creating a bit of a sandwich where I have like the bass and melody and high, higher notes and lower. They're all separated into their own octaves or maybe two octaves if I'm gone a bit crazy with the uh, notes. But then it gives me a bit of structure as well where I put things and then when it comes to mixing I know that certain things are like say the kick drum and the bass line are occupying the same frequencies I know to work on them. And same with the melody I can work on them in tandem then I can create these blocks which I can mix together instead of having to mix all the instruments together. So we've got the root notes for our bass line which kind of kind of flat. Uh, let's sort of add some extra flavor. So we're going to follow our chord structures as well, but we don't want to jump around too much like our melody because then we start losing that home. So there's a good little ratio, which are 80, 20, if you ever heard of it. Um, so 80% is the root note. And then we have 20%, which is the, uh, flavor that we throw on top. So I'm just going to probably We'll follow our melody as well, see what we can add to support that. So I've got E and G with our C. So I could throw a B there. So we could drop it down to um, B lower. So if we were to listen to that with that B dropped. Looking at the melody again. Um, we could drop it down, but we could go up. It sounds a bit high, so we could try something else. Uh, we could add a D. Oops. Could just keep that one in. And we're creating this pattern with the bass line that's like 
jumping could make this a midpoint and then we've got d5 and d6 happening uh, we could add a b So this is really where you start get to experiment. Like this is just a formula to get notes on the page. And honestly, if we listen to this, it sounds quite monotonous. Like it would get very repetitive, very quick. And what this does is it gives us something to work with. So we can start thinking about different elements that want to come in and out. Like we could make the bass line take over the song and then have the other instruments go into the background. We could have uh, the melody start fighting and then have a call and response where they start talking to each other. Really, this is just to get you to a certain point, but then we can start experimenting from there. Now, there's another way we can write out some interesting lines, which uh, uses arpeggiators. Now, if you've used other synthesizers besides the uh, Polyend Tracker, um, an arpeggiator is a way that the synth is able to play extra notes so we can press a whole bunch of notes together and it will either hold or we have to hold the notes down but what it will do is it will use those notes in tandem with the clock to create a sequence which sounds something like this so we can sort of control the timing and we can change the notes as we play so and it's an interesting way to add some extra flavor using a synth. Now programming in, I've programmed it in this way, which not as efficient. We're taking up a lot of real estate as well as um, it took a bit of time to plot that in. So the Polyon Tracker has a nice little command that we can use, which is the actual ARP command itself. And having a bit of a read, we can, uh, it plays exactly the same. And it's composed of two parts. So we've got the ARP and then we've got the, uh, MIDI chord, which is just telling it to play what chord, which all the values are there. So just make sure you pick the right value for what chord you're playing. And yeah, we can have it ramp up. We can also have it ramp down. We've also got the speed and we also got a random chord. So if I was to play around, if I was to play that one, it will play twice as fast. So it sounds like some of the old hardware sound effects. Um, then we can make it go down, we can make it go down twice as slow. Uh, then we've got like true random. And it's just a nice way to throw some random elements into the song. And it follows the main melody structure, so if I turn those back on. This one's a bit weird because I didn't make it a minor, but really um, just play around and experiment. One thing I wanted to chat about with the arpeggiators is how with a synthesizer, you could have played with them and created some more interest with the uh, sound that came out. Now with the synthesizers, people got a little bit fancy and started creating some ways to make some really cool patterns. And one thing especially with like if you have heard the Roland 303 uh, acid bot you could actually jump the notes up and down so if I wanted to say make this a six step instead of having it play the arpeggiator what I might do is follow the note and drop it down one and that's just really simple by going one down so if we were to listen to that by itself there was another thing that I wanted to show is if you had a drum machine and say you had a sound on there that you're not really using for your track, what people used to do is they could take that sound, make it really short so it's like a click, and then they route that into the clock of the synthesizer. So the synthesizer would only step to the next part of the sequence when that um, pattern went off. And then what they would do is as the kicks and the snares and all that is playing with the um, machine, it's also firing these clocks. So what I've done is I created a bit of a clock pattern here with spacings of where I want these notes to hit. But I used the insert command to edit um, instead delete because what would happen on the synth is every time it received one of those clocks it would actually change to the next sound and play it. So if we were to play this now 
not inspiring, but it sort of demonstrates the idea that we could create these offset patterns. So it's like, say you played five notes on the synthesizer, played like a set nice seven chord or nine chord, and then on the groove box you had this syncopated clock. Uh, that would keep running and then they'll, the rhythm and the notes would get out of sync. So you're creating this melody line that's sort of shifting through the um, drums as well. So it creates a lot more variance. So definitely explore this idea as well. Uh, there's a lot to be um, played with here. So another trendy thing that's been popping up on YouTube is, so we had polyrhythms in the last video. Let's have a chat about polymeters because they're kind of the same but different and they do something quite unique to our sound and what it really is so in the previous video it's like we have equal temperament um, patterns but they're offset so we had uh, one and three three and five so four hits on this side would equal five hits on this side and they'll sync up on the four and the five but polymeters is more the amount of notes that keep repeating so like our arpeggiator we can program in a series of notes so i'm just going to program in a series of four but on the other on the second one we have a different number so it could be five it could be three i'm just going to program in three so we're going to go c so a basic major try and then this pattern just keeps repeating forever so what i might do is just leave that space on the end so when i copy and then paste it it should put me in the right spot if I have the right step amount. There we go. And we'll paste that through. And same thing here, we'll copy all of these. Copy, could have waited, but we'll paste them in as well. So if we play this together, and they get our sync and they play different notes together, they play some notes that are together, and they just keep rolling through the sequence until they line back up again. And yeah, that pattern will keep looping through. So. If you create a little melody line and just keep repeating that uh, melody segment, so it could be one bar and you keep playing over and over, and then you had the second part that's sort of out of sync with it, uh, it creates these really cool patterns that are always evolving because different notes are hitting at the same time, and it creates these clashes which could sound really nice together. So something else to experiment with. Theory part aside, I hope that gave you some inspiration here and I'm going to start working with some actual sounds now, not the NES samples that I've got loaded in. I'm pretty sure everyone would be uh, happy with that. What I like to do straight away is we've got that sample loaded and now that I've done majority of the work with a tone that I'm used to, I just like picking a sound and seeing how it's going to sound over the top. So if I start playing, so I like that sound and what I can do is inst instead of loading that in and then changing all the samples, what I'm going to do is just load it straight over the top of this one. So we're just going to go add next. Uh, it will ask you to make sure that you're okay with it. So yes. And then if we play that, nope, uh, probably need a different sound. All right, so I'll replace those NES samples. So if we play everything together. Still sounds kind of boring. So there's a couple of ways we can use the tracker to add some extra flavor, which can be quite cool. First off, if we're in record mode, if we scroll backwards, we have these different variables that we can use to sort of shape how the sound comes out. So if we want it to be like a very harsh cutoff, just going to work with the bass. So there's three different options. We have off, we have cut, and we have fade. So off will trigger the uh, note to be released. So like you release a note off the keyboard. So that will tell the envelope to cut out. So that one's really good if you've got different um, envelopes that you're working with in your instruments. Cut, as, sound, as it sounds, just cuts the sound straight up. So you might get some clicks. And then fade uh, has its own envelope, so it sort of forces the sound out. So using these, we can sort of plot these through to create a little bit more rhythmic interest. Uh, we can also copy and then paste them in as well. And we can do that for the melody as well. 
So it's just given it a little bit more extra flavor than the initial envelope. Another way we can add, like, say if we had three notes together, I'm just going to change this to 13. So if we play them together, and you wanted them a little bit more choppy. So we can use the gate length to change how long. We can also sort of treat this like a synth and actually bend some of the notes as well. And with our chiptune melodies, having a very limited sound and being able to augment it creates some really cool effects. So I'm just going to add some slides up and down, which I think, yep, yeah, here they go. So I'm going to slide down here and reading the notes, uh, it sort of gives you how much time it's going to slide. So we can... We can hear how much it's going to slide. Uh, we can throw some of these through and see what it sounds like. Uh, we could make that one go up because I feel it should. So using sly commands can sort of give a bit of different sound to just having a bit of a pause, I decided to change the sound just because it sounds a little bit more in style of what sort of track I'm making. There's another effect that we can use alongside our slide commands is a glide. And if you ever use a synth, the glide is a way we can sort of tell the synthesizer transition from one note to another, so how it pitch falls. And if we look on here, um, certain percentages will show how quick it is or how long it will be. So if we get the glide command, and then we just play it, and then we extend it. It takes a bit because what's happening is it's when it hits this trigger here, it wants to go to G, but this value will tell you how fast it'll go up to G. Like something like that. Maybe we can put another G in here, and we can use these buttons to plot out how much we want. So another thing we can do with uh, the tracker is bring in the uh, roll command as well like we did with the drums because it does add some nice rhythm to the sound as well. And just adding some little flavors like that, like I do have a sequence in here program that could be a roll but we can go a lot faster. Which can add some nice accents to our melody line as well. Now, the next thing I wanted to talk about is we can actually switch between different types of instruments. So I've got, we'll go into here. So I've got that sound loaded up. I might try and find something that's similar. So I'll bring that one in. So all we need to do is use the scroll wheel to change between the different instruments. We can also program it, just make sure that we're in instrument mode. But you can create this sort of effect where we're jumping between different sounds. And if we overlay the drums as well, it creates some really cool textures there. And we can take this a step further, like we could have five or six instruments, we could have an instrument that has a bunch of slice commands on it that we can switch between, create some real hocketing sounds where it's like each individual note is a different sound. So really this is something to explore as well. Now, leading on from that hocketing point, there's one thing I was showing when talking about a more chiptune style of music where you wanna take up as much of the real estate as you can because you only have four channels, you only have a certain amount of sounds and you really wanna expand on that real estate. And when I listen to Chip Chew Music made with uh, LSDJ, it has this really cool texture that's going on in the background because you have the main melody, you have the uh, supporting melodies or bass line, and then you start getting all these like little fragments that will come through the sound. Now I've gone through and loaded up a few different elements that I can bring in and all I'm going to do is have it in instrument mode and then use it to plot little bits through, not too many, but we'll see what happens. Now let's have a listen to what we have so far. 
they're not too distinct like i did put them at the very end of so they get cut out pretty quickly but just having those little accents here and there through your melody really help out and if we look at the real estate so the empty slots that we've used like we've so we have a few spots in the bass line that we could add this stuff um but i do like that uh length there so it's really a mindset of where do you feel that you can throw in these bits that's not going to uh, intrude on the integrity of what you're trying to make and really i'm pretty happy where we are right now all right we're at a point where we like where we are and before anything else i'm going to go up to file and make sure you save your project. Cool, so I'm really happy where we are with the uh, tracker now, and we've got a nice little drum beat, we've got our melody. It's still quite short, but it's about using those mindsets to expand out the, your song, because once you have an idea of what you want, you can definitely draw it out into larger pieces. And using these mindsets with how you make your music, like you might not like what I've done, but the idea of using these rules and bending those rules, uh, I find that's where I make my best work. So really, I hope you found this stuff useful. And if you think it was useful to someone else that's struggling to make a melody, give this video a thumbs up because it helps the algorithm point this video to them as well. So I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, the next video I'm going to be going through how to create a pad and some textures so we can have some really nice lush chords and condense it down to one channel and then creating some textures to glue the whole loop together so we can create some really cohesive music. So I thank you for sticking around with me with this video and I hope to see you next time.